So at this point, um, I'm excited to essentially kick off the next six, 15 minute lightning round meets TED talk meets kind of grid overview talks. Um, the way these are generally organized is by walking through functional areas, but, um, but they're all kind of a different flavor, a different bite of, bite of the grid apple, so to say. So we're gonna have three 15 minute talks, as you see on the right there, uh, or your left, uh, followed by a 15 minute break to let you stretch your legs again. And then we're gonna close out with another three 15 minute talks. Um, and I, I hope you enjoy, I'm excited to hear this. Uh, I'll maybe wrap up most of these with a summary question uh, to kind of bring it back. But without further ado, I'm going to invite Neil up to the stage. Um, Neil's going to be talking about generally integrated planning functional area. And uh, Neil is the industry executive director of utilities at Oracle. And we are happy to have you here, Neil. Happy to be here. You want the... I have one slide. Just push it once, maybe. One more. Oh, oops. Hmm. It doesn't matter that much. That didn't work very well. So just leave that. Put, put that away. Put the other. <laughs> it doesn't really do much good. Um, hi there. Happy to be here. Um, I almost had to cancel this talk. Um, the last panel, Phil said they had all the planning figured out and it was all set and there was no problems. <laughs> and so I was, was going to rip this up. But fortunately, at the end, he saved me by saying that was just the light duty um, vehicle part of it that it's actually going to be very complicated and moving into the future the planning process is going to get harder and harder. So given that I've decided to go forward with this with the discussion. Um, so I've got broken into sort of three sections. First one, why is integrated planning important and why is it in a technology discussion? So hopefully I can answer those things. Um, so utility executives are working hard to keep up with the pace of change that's being forced on them, mostly from the outside, and primarily because of decarbonization of the grid. Um, this requires utilities to maintain the, the features and capabilities they've always had, safety, reliability, affordability, at the same time becoming agile businesses that can react optimally to a large and growing number of new constraints, threats, and challenges. Modernization of the grid is central to this, to these changes. And navigating this course is going to require new tools and new ways of working that just weren't required in the past. That the processes and ways that they did things in the past was, was fine. And that may, or the, the thesis here is that's not going to be true in the future, in the near future. So this means that integrated planning is taking on a new urgency and importance in the industry. Um, especially as the grid modernizes, as utilities become even more central to the economy through electrification of new swaths like transportation and like heating. Um, and as the grid evolves to be a more open collaborative system where utilities need to orchestrate uh, the system as opposed to owning a monolithic sort of environment. So integrated planning has to become more integrated across distribution, transmission, and integrated resource planning. More strategic, starting to incorporate things like ESG, financials, environment, social and governance, metrics, financial, supply chain, and more. More predictive, since the future isn't going to look like the past as much as it did before. And so there's going to need to be more of a predictive aspect um, and sort of a searching of the space kind of a planning or up um, situation in the future. More collaborative, both within the utility and across its various businesses and externally with the new uh, players who are going to have more and more to do with grid and the grid services. Um, and finally, more ubiquitous, with this planning function becoming really core to everything the utility does and something that they can rapidly ramp up and down and scale as needed and not just be a one-off thing that they do when they have like a rate case or some other situation. So making a system that can take advantage of new technologies like the cloud that allow you to be elastic, to really ramp up and down capabilities quickly and cost effectively and make better use of these tools. Now, this, a lot of this has been talked about already. Modernizing the grid is going to unleash a whole bunch of new forces on the utility. We've talked about EV charging infrastructure and behind the meter charging. We've talked about DERs at scale, utility scale storage, escalating central renewable generation. It's, it's gone like this, it's going like this still. New regulatory constructs, which are going to, which got talked about a bit this morning. Encouraging third-party uh, services to be uh, provided to the grid instead of building their own. 
and new business models potentially open to utilities that, that can be new opportunities for utilities to help support these third party entities who are providing services to the grid. And using the 100 years of expertise the utilities have at managing these kinds of assets as a, as a potential new business opportunity and more demanding customer requirements. And of course, the infrastructure bill and potentially the Build Back Better bills are going to add fuel, both financial and political, to this. OK, so solutions. <clears throat> so my premise is, is what it's needed is what I'm terming a business digital twin um, for use by utility executives that provide an agile, data-driven, defensible, and integrated strategic planning cockpit to effectively navigate the energy transition. So the digital twin concept isn't new. Uh, it's recently become sort of popular. Um, typically, it's defined as a digital representation of physical components <clears throat> and systems via software modeling. And then that representation gets used to predict future outcomes. And um, as I said, this isn't a new concept. Since the advent of computing, there were simulations and models. But it's gained substantial mind share in recent years, but primarily for physical systems. And even in our industry, you'll see find digital twins of, of transformers and turbines and grids and those kinds of things. What I'm talking about here, though, is a little bit different than that, <clears throat> focused on the business and the business processes of the utility. So like all digital twins, a business digital twin can vary in sophistication and complexity as a function of what you're trying to accomplish in the kind of data input you have. And this could be true. You could have a sim relatively simplified gas turbine model. You could have a very extremely complex one, depending on your outcome that you're after and the kind of cost to benefit analysis you have. The same thing can apply to a business digital twin. It can be starting from a particular part of your business or line of business. It can be a broader sort of systems, systems of systems view. Um, these would allow users with confidence to derive alternative scenarios and engage in serious data-driven what-if analyses backed up by a comprehensive connected model of the key aspects of the business. This model, these models would be continually updated with as-is data, new insights, external inputs like regulatory changes, supply chain constraints, customer demands, and the like. So this business digital twin becomes the utility executive's co-pilot, providing a defensible, continually improving asset that can be used to both optimize internal planning and portfolios, and more effectively communicate the effects of policies and, and the investments they've received, or the lack of investments that are being provided, to customers, regulators, interveners, and policymakers. So what does it take to build a business to build digital twin? So I've broken into sort of four areas. First area is data, a common language across the entire business, uh, represented by a consistent data model and semantic structure that allows you to, to compare apples to apples across your business. Second are the models. You have to have uh, some ability to model the business at whatever level of sophistication that your outcome requires, um, and to approximate the degree of accuracy that that requires. <clears throat> the third one is an optim some sort of an optimizer, which yep, that picture does show, um, where you go back and you feed, you feed back the outputs of the digital, di business digital twin against key business KPIs, and then iterate the inputs in order to create better and better scenarios. And that's part of this idea of this being a continuous process, not something you stand up once for a, pro for a given output and then put away but you continue to, to grow and build this, this capability. And then finally, acquires a good user interface. Combines intuit and intuitive and easy to grasp understanding of the scenario, various scenario outcomes, <clears throat> both for power users within the organization and then a, also for key stakeholders outside the utility, because a, a key part of this always is convincing others why you're doing what you're doing and to get buy-in from the people, who, from the stakeholders that matter. So why is investment in integrated planning critical right now? So the 2020s were being termed the decade of action. If you look at, at COP26 and sort of the, the discussion around the world of keeping us under two degrees C, potentially, um, the utility industry is in front and center in this race. There will be many decisions made, all without enough data, all with unexpected consequences, yet we only have one shot to get this right. Um, so that means that success or failure rides on the ability to optimally plan these investments using as much data as we can get hold of, exploring as many scenarios as we can, 
and including as much of the ecosystem and stakeholder map as, as we can. And in my opinion, that's the role of modern in integrated strategic planning. With the upcoming federal infrastructure spending wave and potentially with the new bill as well, and momentum continuing after COP26, it's critically important that the financial and social capital that are being built and political capital as well are spent efficiently and much more importantly, optimally to produce the outcomes that we all want, which is rapid decarbonization coupled to continuous, continued reliable, safe and affordable power. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. I have, um, I could ask a, a couple questions here, but I think I'll start on just kind of modeling in general. You, you were mentioning using, you know, models to help with planning processes, which are really important parts of it. Um, but, you know, several of us may have heard or been part of discussions, you know, there are drawbacks to modeling. You can't know everything. Um, could you speak to kind of where you see models being as in terms of being prepared for modeling? kind of a modern grid um, and the, the computational needs and, and if, we're there, if we're there yet or what kind of development we might want to be pushing, pushing along in the next year. Yeah, I, I, I sort of break the models into two parts. One sort of the physical models of the grid, the kinds of things that you would, utilities are comfortable with doing already, um, you know, state analysis and those kinds of things, which tell you sort of, if you have the right inputs, what the outputs are going to look like, what the, what the physical system would, would transform to. Um, the main part that I think is missing most is the business model. So what is the, what is the, where do the financials look like? What is, what is the sort of the internal part of the business look like under these different scenarios? Um, human resources, you know, things that you don't think about so much as being part of the models are really important. I think it got discussed earlier that it's great to have all the technology, but if you can't get the business to move, and if you can't, it doesn't make sense, and if you can't properly convince the stakeholders who are putting the money up, um, then you're not gonna get the outcome you expect. So to me, the, the big gap is in the business modeling part of the, of the mm. solution story. Yeah, that, that's great. And if you, had to, if you had to pull forward one aspect of this integrated, this integrated planning in the next year, what would you, what would you really want to emphasize? You know, what would you want to see moved um, soonest? Well, to me, you know, I talked about this as a scalable thing. I, 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 if you think about a digital twin in the, in the physical, where the words usually used, um, that means a whole bunch of things. It can be a really simple sort of small piece of one physical process, or it can be a large integrated uh, model. And so you sort of have to meet the, the, the customer where they are. You know, what do they need right now? Can you start with something relatively simple that models a piece of your business that's really important right now, you know, which could be, would be different for every utility? Mm -hmm. um, and then get that starting point. But the key thing is to maintain a model that, that can grow and learn and, and get bigger and bigger. You're never going to build the whole thing at once. It would never be cost effective to do so. And frankly, you wouldn't trust the output because you hadn't been through these iterative processes. So I think you have to start somewhere. That somewhere is a function of, of your problems of the day. But then make sure you build a system that can constantly grow and learn and be maintained and not turn into something that gets put up once, used for a purpose, and then put away. Mm -hmm. I gotta ask: Are you thinking machine learning? Is that a certainly a, a piece, of, you're it, looking a piece at? of it? But a, you know, some of it can be as simple as just getting the um, you know the models don't have to be complicated, especially if they're integrated. So if you take you know a, some set of relatively simple models and combine them, it gets complicated really fast, and it starts to give you outputs inputs, not in, outcomes that you may not expect. So these unexpected outcomes might start to pop up as you connect mm -hmm. these things. So I think AI and machine learning are part of it, but they don't have to be at the start. I think you can be relatively simple. The idea is to integrate these things and run them against a set of scenarios and look for those corner cases and things that, that might surprise you. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end on integrated planning. Thank you, Neil, so much. Thank you.